Over the seven or eight past years, I've asked my guests to give me a biography of themselves in seven words, a haiku of sorts, or if you're modern, a tweet. And the seven words that Kianga Yamata Taylor gave me is Texas, intense, work, partner, books, and beer. <laughs> the seven words that Sean King gave me are fighting for justice with all my heart. On the 50th anniversary of 1968, a very tumultuous year in American history as it is one this year, we are focusing the Live from the New York Public Library spring 2018 season in part on the assassination of Martin Luther King. We will begin and end this evening with audio clips and speeches he gave. We will start with an excerpt from a sermon Martin Luther King gave called The Drum Major Instinct on February 4th, 1968, two months to the day before his assassination. He delivered it from the pulpit of Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, his own congregation. Immediately after the sermon, Kianga Taylor and Sean King will take to the stage for their conversation. After the conversation, they will take a handful of questions. We ask you to write them down. They will be collected during their conversation around 7.57. I was hoping for something to happen there. <laughs> After I read the final question and it is answered, we will end the evening with an excerpt from a speech given at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. on March 31st, 1968, four days before Martin Luther King was assassinated. This will conclude the evening. But first listen carefully to the drum major instinct before warmly welcoming Kianga and Sean to the live from the New York Public Library stage. And I would submit to you this morning that what is wrong in the world today is that the nations of the world are engaged in a bitter, colossal contest for supremacy. And if some doesn't happen to stop this trend, I'm sorely afraid that we won't be here to talk about Jesus Christ and about God and about brotherhood too many more years. If somebody doesn't bring an end to this suicidal thrust that we see in the world today, none of us are going to be around because somebody is going to make the mistake through our senseless blunderings of dropping a nuclear bomb somewhere and then another one is going to drop and don't let anybody fool you. This can happen within a matter of seconds. They have 20 megaton bombs in Russia right now that can destroy a city as big as New York in three seconds with everybody wiped away in every building. And we can do the same thing to Russia and China. But this is why we are drifting, and we are drifting there. Because nations are caught up with the drum major instinct. I must be first. I must be supreme. Our nation must rule the world. And I am sad to say that the nation in which we live is the supreme culprit. And I'm going to continue to say it to America. Because I love this country too much to see the drift that it has taken. God didn't call America to do what she's doing in the world now. God didn't call America to engage in a senseless, unjust war as a war in Vietnam. And we are criminals in that war. We have committed more war crimes almost than any nation in the world. And I'm going to continue to say it. And we won't stop it. Because of our pride and our arrogance as a nation. But God has a way of even putting nations in their place. And the God that I worship has a way of saying, don't play with me. He has a way of saying, as the God of the Old Testament used to say, the Hebrews, don't play with me, Israel. Don't play with me, Babylon. Be still and know that I'm God. And if you don't stop your reckless course, I'll rise up and break the backbone of your power. 
And that can happen to America. Yes. Every now and then I go back and read Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. And when I come and look at America, I say to myself, the parallels are frightening. <laughs> yeah, that's the king that um, that's the king that they never show. Wow. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, um, several things came to mind hearing it, and, and um, even I was thinking of more of why they never show mm -hmm. this this version of Dr. King, and I think as I think about so much that's going on in our country right now. Like I'm, I'm thinking, I've been thinking so much about these wonderful young kids and you and I talked about them backstage from, from Parkland and their leadership. But I'm also thinking about the, the young leaders in Sacramento mm. who mm. are shutting down highways because police shot and killed a, a young brother there. And, and I've, been play, I've been playing with this concept and I think I see it I see it in society. There's, there's the visible civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. That is the movement that we're shown, that was filmed, that they used to sell car insurance and everything else. There's the visible civil rights movement, but then there's this wonderful, beautiful, rich, challenging, invisible civil rights movement. And I think what many of us are trying to do now is to say, what lessons are you hiding from us mm. that could be useful today? And, uh, and there's so much in what King was saying there that I think is a part of that invisible civil rights movement that, that is not the March on Washington right. that, that goes beyond that. I think it's pretty instructive um, <clears throat> to the moment that we're in right now because one of the questions that... Um, people ask, and, and we were talking about this earlier, is why have the students at, you know, Parkland been so uh, warmly received? I mean, Obama, the Obamas wrote a handwritten letter um, over the weekend, um, you know, people getting on Twitter talking about the people hundreds of thousands That's of right. dollars or millions right. of dollars that they were right. uh, donating to the, to the march that happened this past weekend, and I think the, the clip of uh, King gives you some indication, um, at least to me, um, which is that black movements are never popular in this country. I mean, the, the civil rights movement is kind of, uh, you know, been woven into this weird narrative about American progress uh, today. It was po it's popular in retrospect. Yeah, but in its actual time, Right? right, King is reviled. I mean, we don't assassinate people who uh, are are uh, popular and you know deemed to be uh, uh, heroic. Those tend, you know, not necessarily. To or be even I saw where Ber where Bernice King, his daughter, recently tweeted that on the day of his death, he was listed as the mm -hmm. least liked, least right. popular public leader in America. Right, like uh, the flip of the, the most hated public leader in America, right. yet we, we look back retrospectively and see him differently, right. but in the moment that wasn't who he was. So in, in the moment, the, the civil rights movement, um, you know, people in the, the, the mainstream media and elected officials in particular saw this as black people demanding too much too fast. And so in the Nina Simone song, um, that uh, was playing earlier. One of the lines she says is, go slow. And that, that was always the, the response to um, uh, civil rights activists. And, and so to me that connects with why the kids at Ferguson, who are doing many of the same things. I mean, people think that Ferguson uh, was just uh, uh, riots. Um, and that certainly was, an, in my opinion, an important part uh, of Ferguson, but there were walkouts in Ferguson. There were teachings. 
uh, in, in, in right. Ferguson. There was a civil disobedience uh, uh, component um, to the Ferguson protest, but black protests always expose the central lie that is at the heart of American society. The idea that this is a free um, and just country, uh, that this is a country um, that is based on, you know, liberty. And it's the black movement. If you, if you know anything about the history of black people in this country, it completely unravels that. And so, in my opinion, it means that there's a kind of inbuilt hostility yeah. to the mobilization uh, of black people in ways that the protests uh, around reforming gun laws don't necessarily lend themselves to because they don't challenge, um, they don't challenge the, the, the status quo in some ways. So King, in the last couple of weeks of his life, was interviewed um, by a reporter I think Jose Iglesias with um, the New York Times Magazine. And one of the things that he said was that in some ways, civil rights was easy for the US government because it meant that you changed some laws. Right. And, but what was harder was dealing with racism and segregation outside of the South in American cities because that required a redistribution of resources. Um, it required someone to give up something. And I think that is still what black movements demand yeah. of American society, is I, that something must be given up. I see it, I see that precisely. And I think also what happens here is, so these kids have experienced a pain that also touches white people. In a, in, a very, in a very real, direct way, and so they understand it in a way that, that um, there's a myth that police brutality never, never touches white people, but I could tell you a hundred stories mm -hmm. of, particularly <clears throat> when you have the intersection of people with mental illness who are brutalized by police. So white people are still affected by police brutality, but the, the news doesn't even right. tell those stories. And so when you have these mass shootings, it connects with a, a broad swath of, of the country, first off. Mm -hmm. And I think secondly, that it, it already falls within the talking points of the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and so, the, so people in power, the establishment can easily support it in a way that is deeply uncomfortable for, right. uh, for them politically about police brutality. Like I, right. I have to tell people, um, that most of the horrible district attorneys and even police chiefs and sheriffs across the country, most of them classify themselves as Democrats. Mm -hmm. And when people hear that, and they're never being held accountable by the powerful Democrats in those states, be it right. the senators, be it if in, in St. Louis or in Missouri, Democrats who had major juice mm. refused to hold small local Democrats accountable. And so it stung me even. Um, it's a, it, there, there are two people that you can never diss. The, the, the list is growing long. Like mm -hmm. Beyonce is almost on that list. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but uh, certainly Oprah is on the list. Mm -hmm. And uh, for a lot of people, like in my house, Barack Obama's, now, not, now see I have major criticisms of Barack Obama, but my, she, he is on her list. Right. And so, don't give her my to her, like, <laughs> like, I could even tell her, like, but listen, I, did, I need to school you on drones. And she's uh -huh. like, listen, there must have been a reason for why this. But that's a huge part of America. Well, uh -huh. When I heard Oprah compare the no, kids yeah, from yeah. Parkland yeah. to the civil rights movement, and she said something to the effect of, at, at no point has she seen something that so clearly connected student leaders to the sit-in movement. Mm -hmm. And I thought, damn, <clears throat> you never said that about us. Like we never hardly even got a compliment mm -hmm. or an acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. And um, I, saw a few, I saw a few movement leaders like, and I mean like people on the ground in Ferguson, in Baltimore. Ashley Dates, she yeah. had a 
who saw it. Incredible statement. It hurt them. It crushed them because it was like, we we were dying for you to just say, I believe in them. I support them. And there were many times where I thought, okay, maybe with Sandra Bland, Oprah will say something. Maybe with such and such, maybe she'll stand up. Maybe she'll speak out here. And, um, but that, that's, that's another part of the dynamic. I think that it's easy when you have this troglodyte Republican Donald Trump yeah. in, in the White House. It does. That now we all want right. to, you know, right. we can all sign up and, and talk about how, uh, you know, horrible the establishment is. It was much more complicated for those people when you have a black man in office. And so, you know, I think that that is also um, part of the dynamic because when Obama was president, you know, people like that, right? Were loath to say anything that could be construed as embarrassing him or putting him on the spot in a way that there's just no sense of that. I'm glad, um, now. I'm glad you said that because, I mean, I, I voted for Obama twice. I, I campaigned for him both mm-hmm. times. But um, so many families that I work with who were horribly affected by police brutality told me that either he made a promise to them mm-hmm. or the Attorney General, uh, mm-hmm. Loretta Lynch, or Eric Holder made yep. promises to them <laughs> that hey, before we leave office, we'll make sure the Department of Justice handles your case. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you at least eight different cases that had been open for years Mm -hmm. that they left open until Donald Trump won. And each of those families to this very day, I'm I'm thinking of the family of Alton Sterling, the family Mm -hmm. of Sandra Bland, the family of Eric Garner. You have now, in this city, you have Erica Garner died before she was even able to hear what the DOJ is gonna say right. uh, about her father's death four years ago. Right. And, and so we have to get, I resonate with the frustration of King because we have, to be able, we have to be able to critique the empire one way or another. And, and what King found is the more he critiqued those in power, instead of just saying, here's what, here are the rights we're fighting for. Right. Um, it, you know, he, he lost his life over it. Well, I think that what, part of the conclusions that he's coming to towards the end of his life is, um, you know, he says, it, he writes it at one point in this, uh, this article that is actually published after uh, he's assassinated that, it's the black movement that is exposing um, the interrelated flaws of US society, uh, that the black struggle exposes existential and systemic flaws as opposed to uh, superficial um, flaws. And I think you saw that in Ferguson, uh, you saw that in Baltimore, that these are issues that cannot be resolved in this or that election. These are issues that cut to the core of racism, inequality, that some of us argue is central to the functioning of US society. And that is part of the reason why uh, there is always a hostility to black protest. But I think that with the Parkland students, I think in general, whenever you have the emergence of a potential social movement, you have people who exist along the spectrum. So you have people, <clears throat> just like in Black Lives, in the, the sort of uh, movement of Black Lives Matter, you had people who initially were like, oh, we just need body cameras. Right. From that to we need to abolish the police. Right. And so in this, you have a, a similar thing where there are people who just think, well, if we just get universal background checks, you know, then and ban assault weapons, then everything will be fine. And then you'll have another end of the spectrum that begins to ask the question of why is this society so violent in the first place? Right. Is that just about gun ownership? Is it just about a lack of a background check? Or is there something more inherent 
One, about a society that is constantly at war. I mean, this is the 15th anniversary of the U.S. illegal entry into the Iraq war. And so for, you know, for many of these people, high school students, this country's been at war for their entire lifetime. Right. So that, that's one part of it. But even if you look further, what does it mean in a country that was founded on genocide, that then became the richest country in the history of the world through the forced enslavement of black people, and then through the violent expropriation of waves upon waves of millions upon millions uh, of immigrants. It means that it's a country steeped in, in, in blood and violence from its very roots. Yeah. And so it's deep in the those, fabric. Yeah. those questions <clears throat> start to come up the longer this goes on. Right. And that's when it won't be popular. That's when you won't be, you know, having the, 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 the front page of, of, of Time magazine. That's when Obama will stop writing you love letters. That's when Dianne Feinstein won't want to speak right. on a platform. Well, it's part, that's part of why I love Emma Gonzalez so much is because she straight away brought a depth mm -hmm. and seriousness and pain mm -hmm. and heaviness, like, she, like right from like, I was looking at a picture of her, and I could hard, it was a picture, and I could hardly look into her eyes. Mm -hmm. And I mean, mm -hmm. she, she brings the full weight of the pain that yes. they experienced. And um, part of why I've even found myself feeling a need to, mm -hmm. to have my foot in both worlds <clears throat> to say, on one hand, these kids are beautiful and brilliant, and they're, they, are, they are literally kids. Yes. They're, some of them are 14 and 15 okay. years old. They s saw 17 people murdered last month. Um, and they are working so hard to be intersectional. They're trying. Like it's a, every day, it's a valiant effort with mm -hmm. all of them. And at the same time, there are other people who have these legitimate questions about, well, why, why are they getting that? And mm -hmm. there's even a part of me that sometimes says history is, history is weird in the sense that you can't choose the timing of a moment. Right. Like many other high schools have had tragedies, mm -hmm. but there was just something, there, was, there were five or six variables that happened that this one just resonated. And, and a lot of it was just those particular kids. Mm -hmm. And... Um, they, and some of it is even, you alluded to it, how Trumpism has pissed so many of us off mm -hmm. that the, the dial is already turned up, you know, very high anyway, but. Um, no, I mean, I, I was, you know, I think if we stop to think about it, it was <clears throat> fairly shocking that, you know, this major massacre happens in Las Vegas and it barely registers at all. Right. And then I think a week later, or a few weeks later, there's a church in Texas. Absolutely. And, and, and people yeah. are, are shot and slaughtered. And I think that, you know, there's the, the, the kids and they're middle class kids and they have an expectation that things should be better uh, for them um, that I think is, is, is part of this. But I also think that it's a generation of people who have been influenced, plugged in to Black Lives Matter yeah. and to the, what has been happening uh, over the last several years that has really communicated that the way that you change the circumstances in your life that are constraining you is to protest, is to mobilize and to be activated. And so I think that that is an important continuity with the movement at a moment where, you know, I'll be honest, it's not clear to me where Black Lives Matter um, as a movement is headed. Although I do think that these protests around gun violence and the way that black students have inserted themselves yeah. shows you a potential uh, uh, direction um, in, a, in a way in which the movement can actually be reactivated and regenerated well, through these protests. I'll tell you, and I'll, I mean, I'll confess even for our whole audience here, 
for the first two years maybe of the Black Lives Matter movement, my primary operating philosophy was, and I think a lot of leaders shared this, was if we make these stories known, mm -hmm. if, we, if we make our pain, if we make these names known, mm -hmm. if, we could, if we could make the faces of Mike Brown and Tamir Rice and Freddie Gray yep. and Sandra Bland, if we can make these faces and these names and the injustice known, it will lead us to justice. Mm -hmm. we, we knew it wasn't that simple, but we were operating under the principle mm -hmm. that if we can only make the world aware of the injustice, we're gonna be much more likely to get justice. And I think it took, for me, it took almost four years for me to learn that awareness is probably step one on a 10-step mm -hmm. plan to mm -hmm. getting justice. Mm -hmm. Because what I learned, and it hurts, I learned that most people are willing to be fully aware of the injustice and let it go or do nothing about it. And, and many of us are having to change our paradigm of well, how do we make change happen? Right. And so even as I see the students in Parkland or as I see, see protesters tonight in Sacramento, there's yeah. a huge city council meeting there tomorrow, Part of my fear is I've been where they are now mm -hmm. with the thought, let's make the whole world aware, but people are willing to wait that out. Mm -hmm. And part of what I'm trying to do is to show people there are, there are other practical steps that we have to take to actually making change happen. And awareness just builds the mood, mm -hmm. but it doesn't build change. No, I, th I think that's important. And, you know, I think that part of the, the difficulty, <clears throat> I think, is that there's, there's a way in which the, the system has created this dilemma that is difficult to get out of, which is to say that I think in an age of... Um, destroying public institutions, whether they're public schools, public hospitals, public universities, um, an age of low-wage labor, where people really are being stripped of any real hope for the future, what Democrats and Republicans alike, I would say, have offered as an alternative is prisons and policing. And so in a city like Chicago, where it has been run by the Democratic Party for, you know, three generations, right. there is an unrelenting assault on public institutions. There is a constant giveaway of public resources to the private sector. And what they say to black people is leave. There are over 200,000 black people have left the city of Chicago in the last decade, or we're gonna just fill your neighborhoods with police and we're gonna send you to jail. Yeah. And so in that context, it makes, it, this is what raises the stakes because who are you appealing to? Right. And what is it that you are appealing for? Well, that, and that's, that, the, that's part of the problem. That reminds me of a story that I like to tell. I, uh, my family and I, we were living in Atlanta and um, I got a job in Southern California and we had, I lived in the, I had born and raised in the South, my wife and I both. So we had never, I'd only been to California, like California was like a foreign country to me. Mm -hmm. And so. It is. <laughs> it is another place. <laughs> and uh, so we got a chance to choose where we were gonna live. And so we started Googling things like safe cities in Southern California. Mm -hmm. So we found this place, <laughs> Irvine, California. And, uh, mm -hmm. and we decided that they had, they had great reviewed schools and it was literally listed as the safest city in America. So we moved there, and I kid you not, I'd been there for three or four weeks, and I started realizing that I had never seen a police officer. This is a city with mm -hmm. almost 400,000 people. Mm -hmm. A month goes by, two months go by, and I never, not once, not on the highway, mm -hmm. not on the side streets, not in stores, not in parking lots, I never saw a police car, a police officer. Two and a half months in, I literally have to ask a friend of mine, do they have police in Irvine? 
And he literally said, he said, listen, he said, I'm gonna show you something and it's gonna freak you out. They've, they, have, they moved their police department deep into the woods where no one could ever see it. Like it was so far out of the way and there were like two or three police cars. And here's what I learned. I learned that in Irvine, the safest city in America, they did not define safety as more police. Mm -hmm. They defined safety and they were able to create safety because everyone there had a job and it was a good mm -hmm. paying job. Right. There were literally parks on every other block. Right. There were phenomenal hospitals and doctors. There were grocery stores and farmers markets. It was a thriving, healthy community and they defined safety in a very different way, which is wild because those same people often define safety in our communities as more police. Right. And it's like, but you don't even define that as safety for yourself. And, and what I realized is I started looking into the safest cities in America. Mm -hmm. They're not safe because they have lots mm -hmm. of police. They have tiny police forces. And it's not because they don't have problems with drugs. Mm -hmm. Like my daughter went to the public high school there and kids were struggling with drugs mm -hmm. in every single grade, mm -hmm. but it was treated as a medical problem. Mm -hmm. Kids went to counseling, they went to inpatient treatment. Mm -hmm. And in the, in the same communities that we could move in and out of here in Harlem or, in, or throughout the Bronx, it's not treated that way. Mm -hmm. And so it's wild how in some communities, and it's almost exclusively defined by, by, by race. Yeah, it's not wild, it's just racism. Yeah, right, it's, right. It's like, when, <laughs> right, right. Because part of the absence of police is correlated to the absence of black people, right? And so that is, <clears throat> that's part, that, I mean, this is part of the issue, is that the refusal to invest in the infrastructure that is needed to sure. frankly compensate for the rampant racism yeah. in the private sector, right. you know, where they refuse to hire uh, uh, black people for meaningful jobs and meaningful wages and meaningful benefits, that this is the alternative, is, is, is policing, which is why these movements raise systemic and existential questions for the system that instantly makes them uh, 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 hostile yeah. to, the, to the political status quo, especially when you have black people in charge. And so that, I think, you know, is why the, the reaction from not just Obama and Holder and Loretta Lynch, but the, the, the largest grouping of black political uh, 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 representatives in American history who, you know, hold varying degrees of power, but who don't want to hear it yeah. because they don't have a solution any more than any of these other people have a solution. And so it, it makes the intensity of the political dispute that much more uh, uh, intense because, you know, unlike universal background checks, which everyone thinks that they agree with, um, that, that, that doesn't, that's, that's, not posing, right. that's not posing a threat. Well, I mean, part, part of what I'm trying to, to show us through our frustration, I guess there, there are two points. One, so much that is wrong with this country, I think we've, we've reduced it to if we get Trump out of office, we'll be in much better shape. Right. Now there's, there's, there's <laughs> an element of truth there, but we've conflated all of our problems, many of which he had little to nothing to do with, to, or that to, a, pr him. Yeah, yeah. to a prayer that Mueller right. finds a smoking gun or something. Right. And, and so we have, to, we have to see our problems Trump is a problem, yes. and, we, and I acknowledge it and, 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 and will we'll come against him in every way that I can, but our problems are so much bigger than him. I think some of what, I, what I'm trying to show people, there, there, are, there are four things that I think I have grown to believe we need to make change mm -hmm. happen. So we often get this first one and we're like, oh shit, we're about to make change happen. Mm. The first thing you need is you need people but they have to be highly energized. Mm -hmm. and, we, and we do that well. Mm -hmm. Like energy comes in many forms. It's anger, it's passion, it's fury. So over the, even if you think over the past two years, 
we've had some high energy moments where mm -hmm. people came together. So you need people that need to be energized, but you need people and they need to be organized. Mm -hmm. And sadly, I think we've reduced organizing people to getting your email address and, and, and maybe if, if Getting you, on a moveon.org <laughs> list. Maybe your cell phone number if you're gracious. Right. And, what, and I think a deeper part of why we've struggled is we're often energized, but we're not deeply organized. Like here is a quick way that I would define organization. Are you working with an organization that actually knows who you are? Do they know what you're good at? Do they know your skills or background and are they leveraging that in any kind of way? Mm -hmm. Like, so I ask people like, does the Democratic Party even know you? Mm -hmm. People are like, no. Like, like, most people even say they don't even have, they don't even get emails from the Democratic right. Party. Like, I haven't gotten an email from the Democratic Party in like five years. Right. But deeper than that, they don't know me. So you need people and they need to be energized and they need to be organized. Sometimes we get those two things and it starts to really feel like change is gonna happen. But the third thing is where we struggle, you really have to have a comprehensive plan that matches the magnitude of the problem. Mm -hmm. And part of why we have failed, particularly when I think about criminal justice or justice reform, sometimes you can write our plans on the back of a napkin. Mm -hmm. Or you could put our whole plan on one page of a website but as you know, these problems are complex. Mm -hmm. In the United States, we have a million police officers. We have 20,000 police departments. Mm -hmm. We have 8,000 jails and prisons, 2,400 district attorneys. Each under their own jurisdiction. Absolutely, with right. their own policies right. and personalities. But our plan on how we're gonna fight back on this is, is way too simple for the magnitude of the problem. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing is you need a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And what I know, and there was actually a brilliant article in the New York Times today about depression and frustration from movement leaders. And part of what stung about seeing people send out $500,000 checks left and right is this movement is deeply underfunded. But there's one group in America that gets those four things well. Energized people, organized people, they have really well-crafted plans and a lot of money. Mm -hmm. who, who is it? It's the NRA, mm -hmm. it's the NRA. And we have to get to the point where we say, damn, they're good. They're so good that a man took an arsenal for a military into a first class hotel, kicked out the window mm -hmm. and shot 541 people and our country did nothing. Right. But we didn't do nothing for no reason. We did something because there is a group that's organized and energized with plans and money right. that makes sure nothing happens. And so here's why I still have hope. I have hope because I haven't seen us with the issues that we care about deeply. I haven't seen us get all four of those things moving mm -hmm. at the same time in the same direction. Mm -hmm. And if we had and still failed, I would sink into a depression. But normally, we either have, we have groups with a lot of money but no plan, mm -hmm. or we have people with plans and no money, <laughs> or we have people who are highly energized but not organized. Mm -hmm. And what I see is when you get those four things together, there's change that you can make happen, or in the case of the NRA, change that you can stop from happening. And, and, and I'm encouraged because we haven't thrown, I don't think we've thrown our best efforts at our worst problems. Well, I, I mean, I think there's lots of reasons to be um, optimistic. And I think that in the midst of those four things that we also have to talk about politics and what are the, the ideas that actually shape uh, the movement. So for me, the optimism comes from the fact that people are doing something, yep. right? I mean, there's, there's the, whether it's the, the mobilization of uh, women, you know, the, the women's marches uh, from a year ago, which were some of the largest protests in American history, or just this past January, uh, which were also 
um, I think unexpectedly large. Yeah. I mean, there's, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of people were at the, the, the demonstrations over this past weekend, but there are other examples, like the teacher strike in, in West Virginia, you know, yeah. where... Which you got have, totally drowned out, but it was powerful. It, right? They tried to drown it out, but the, the persistence of the teachers and the solidarity of teachers across the yeah. state made it impossible for them to completely yeah. uh, uh, drown it out. And so I think that this sort of points to the possibility. But one of the things that I feel like always happens on our side is here come the Democratic Party. And you can, you can smell them in the background now, right? For the, the 2018 midterms and then the 2020 uh, uh, election where part of the strategy seems to be that we're gonna sit back and let Trump unravel and use fear as a way to corral people back uh, uh, into, into voting. Because right. that, that was part of, to me, part of the story in 2016 was that there's 100 million people who didn't vote. You know, and ever, the mainstream media will write that off as apathy or whatever. But to me, it, it spoke to something much more profound because if you have a mass mobilization of black people voting in 2008 and 2012, black people voting like they've never voted before, and then you have a 20 year drop, the, the, the lowest turnout for black voters in 2016 for the presidential election, uh, was the first time in 20 years that those numbers went down. You know, it speaks to some of the rot, I think, mm. in that party, because if you vote like you've never voted before in 2008 and 2012, because you believe that Obama is going to help facilitate something different, coming out of the horror show of the Bush administration, the illegal war, drowning uh, uh, New Orleans uh, during Katrina and then crashing the global economy, right? There's an expectation that things will be better. And so what happens when you vote like you've never voted before for someone who promises you nothing to this candidate who tells you America's already great in the midst of a Black Lives Matter movement? America's already great. But there is an expectation that being a Republican, not being a Republican is good enough and that we don't have to promise you anything, that we can rely on fear to discipline our, our, our base. And what happens is that I think for most ordinary people, they check out, people don't vote, so you end up with 100 million people not voting. But for people who are plugged in, that there is a pressure to concede on the terms of the Democrats, right? Not to say, well, if, if, if you want us to vote for you, then you must earn our vote, right? That you must actually articulate some of the demands that we want. Instead, you know, there's, there's very little of that. And is, the demand is that ordinary people come to that party on their terms. And I feel like the lack of an independent political initiative that should exist and that Bernie Sanders shows, has the potential to exist, right? I mean, 13 million people vote for somebody who calls himself a socialist in this country. It's somewhat unbelievable, right? Right. And right. so that the potential exists. And it's just old But there's hostility. Frankly, like, yeah. like <laughs> no, I mean, I think he, was, he is the opposite of everything that's supposed to appeal to young people. And right. I think they're, like... No, and, and I think his rise even helps me understand Parkland and the kids from Parkland. It's like, listen, I think young people are a hell of a lot smarter and more informed and more passionate. Mm -hmm. So you get like a, a cranky old man and young people are like, I love this guy. And it's like, well, why? And, and, and the, the meme was, oh, young people loved him because he was talking about all this free stuff. And it's like, what? Because you talk to you talk to young people, and that's not it at all. They liked his philosophy. They right. and they believed. Yeah, in we do his, want free health care. Right, yeah. right. Or, the, or the military is getting a trillion dollars. Right. Like screw you. Yes, we want free health care, free education. Actually, we'd like all of it. 
Yeah. Yes, thank right, you. Right, right. And he speaks, a... he, he speaks to that. But then it, it feels like to me you, you undercut that and you neuter that by staying tied to this profiteering war party that can't get out of its own way, not because of a bad strategy or, you know, so, someone, you know, screwed up at this or that meeting, but that, you know, they're beholden to the same bankers. Yeah. They're beholden to the yeah. same defense contractors. And it, it means that they inevitably produce bad candidates um, because that is the logic of, 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 the, of the party. So for me, the question is always about how do the, the forces that are disgusted mm. by the Republican Party but are also disgusted by the political status quo that leads us to, you know, back to the cycle uh, of, of war. I mean, that was chilling, listening yeah. uh, to King talk about nuclear warfare 50 years ago. And we have a president who thinks it's funny to tweet about nuclear war with North Korea, right? right? Like, this is, this is what's at stake. This is not, you know, it's not fun and games. Like, there, there's actually quite a bit at stake. And, and the, the question for me is always, how do, does our side strike a pose that is independent so that our movements don't rise and fall every election cycle because we're being terrorized by this party of Neanderthals, you know, who openly threaten to drag us back into the, the, the Stone Age. But then the other party, is kind of just resolute to sit back and say, well, that's why you should vote for us and not actually for anything affirmative or positive. Right. Or I mean, part of even what I'm trying to do is something that I've never done on this level so frequently is even like really examine people's voting records. Mm -hmm. And you start to see like, yeah, Tim Kaine can do like a funny Trump impersonation, but he also votes with Trump like 60% right. of the time, you know, right. and it's like, right. you start to see like, who's voting with who, who right. supports who. And, and so some of what we're doing, all of us out of necessity, I think, is we're just getting, like we're caring many of us for the first time about who works at companies that we spend our money with. We're mm -hmm. worried, we're, we're thinking about, uh, we're thinking about a level of sophistication and nuance with our money, with our votes, and with our politics that I haven't really seen in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. and so th there are some beautiful things going on. Like I, I was actually encouraged mm. recently when um, Elizabeth Warren, I thought, did something that I hadn't seen happen in a long time. She was calling many Democrats out by name. She called 15 of them out by name who voted for this horrible banking bill that mm -hmm. just passed. Mm -hmm. and, she, and she said, hey, it goes without saying that the majority of Republicans voted for it, but it would not have passed mm -hmm. had you 15 <laughs> Democrats not voted for it. And, uh, and so I'm hoping to see more of that, and, but, but that really gets to us demanding it. Mm -hmm. and I think one of the weird things is, uh, I'm a new New Yorker, mm -hmm. and um, New Yorkers live in a really peculiar bubble where, um, like I've, I've spoken over the past four years, I've spoken in 40 states, and I've spoken in states that people, like we have this simplified blue state, red state, and it's not yeah. really accurate either because I've spoken in both of the Dakotas and Montana mm -hmm. and West Virginia and found like really deep progressive communities mm -hmm. in all of those places. But Trump could definitely win again. And, oh, yeah. and, and everything that we hate about our country right now, be it with gun control or our justice system, all of that stuff could absolutely continue to just be the status quo. But what happens here in New York in particular is like everybody around you hates Trump <laughs> and everybody around you wants a sophisticated, you know, gun control platform. And it can convince you that that's what everybody wants. Mm. And um, even social media plays into that because you tend to follow mm -hmm. people it's an echo chamber. It is an echo chamber. Yeah. And I think it, it caused us to not understand why Bernie Sanders won 21 states, mm -hmm. why Trump won 30 states. Because it, like here in New York or in, a, in other coastal communities and stuff like where we are in a peculiar bubble. Mm -hmm. And um, 
part of what I'm trying to do is to even understand, and even when, I, when you try to understand um, the motivations of Trump voters, people, people start saying like, you don't need to understand them. Mm-hmm. And, and what, I, what I know is Trump, this horrible, awful man who was clearly horrible and awful before he was elected, mm-hmm was not just elected for white power and white supremacy. There was a deep frustration in people. And we have to understand what that's about. And we have to understand why 100 million people, many of them who are traditionally Democratic voters, why are so many people so desperate for some type of change? And um, I think that's why, that's why we have to fight for an alternative that, you know, can certainly confront the Nazis and the white supremacists, but can also make a positive appeal to people who are frustrated. And so I think that that there's a certain, I know, part of the the left that just kind of dismisses the idea of, of economic anxiety. And I think that one, we should be clear that, that those actually, most of those people weren't Trump voters. I mean, I think that that's kind of the the mythology out of the election was that Trump was a candidate of ordinary white people. Um, And I think when you look at how people voted that, you know, Trump uh, was a candidate of rich and, you know, upper middle class uh, white people. But to the extent that, uh, that there was an appeal, I think that part of the reason why people dismiss that is because the lives of poor and working class people are so hidden mm. in this country that we, our society glorifies the rich, it glorifies the famous, it glorifies beautiful people and ignores the hardship that surrounds us. I mean, I was thinking about this because I have been on, uh, for inexplicable reasons, I've been on several trains, um, Amtrak trains, yeah. where you, you ride through the backside of the country. Yeah, this sure. is a poor fucking country. Yeah, absolutely. It's broke and, down all and, over the place. And and it is it is ignored. It I mean, is so you have ra- these uh, the millionaires. Is so damn raggedy. It, it is, it is yeah. complete. And you have millionaires who report the news, and they talk to other millionaires right. who are correspondents, who then write for newspapers published by millionaires. So you you have these rich people yeah. who talk to each other, and meanwhile you have millions, tens of millions of people who suffer in this country and it has no expression at all. Right. And so we, our side has to find a way to be in solidarity with those people and not on the lowest common denominator of all the things that we agree with of which there is no tension, but we have to raise the political level. We have to convince working class white people that racism is black people's burden, but it's their problem too. And when they can get away with spending $80 billion a year to maintain a criminal justice system, that that has an impact on all of our, all of our lives, right? It takes money out of our schools, out of hospitals, out of all of the things that could increase the quality of life uh, for ordinary people. So we have to raise the political level, but we have to have our own organizations in order to, to do that and actually influence uh, 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 politics because otherwise it's like the Trump horror show, but then it, th- there's no alternative to it that has any credibility. You know, to that's, me, that's one of the challenges. Yeah, it's one of the reasons that um, me and a, and a group of us, a- almost all of us were alums from the Bernie campaign mm. started this thing called the Real Justice Pact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, what, what, what it is about is a level of complexity that I did not understand. And part of what I've tried to do is to write about my lack of understanding with, with how the political system works. Mm-hmm. So mm. most, organiz- most of the people that we know and love and respect are not able through, through, for a variety of reasons, are not allowed to help guide you through who to vote for, who to vote against. Mm-hmm. Like, let me, let me back up and explain it. 
So most nonprofit organizations, most charities are 501c3s. Mm -hmm. So they can never make political right. endorsements, not explicitly, not implicitly, they can't tweet it. Most of their even staff members won't even retweet a political endorsement of any kind. Well, religious leaders can't either. School officials. For now. Yeah, for now. Yeah. School officials can't, and um, be it leaders of fraternities and sororities can't. Most networks have policies, television networks have policies preventing their staff members, even most newspapers have policies preventing their writers from making political endorsements. So here's what happens. When we need to know who to vote for, we literally only know Democrat and Republican. Mm -hmm. And I've had so many people come to me and say, like, I've had people literally, like, in a voting booth say, Sean, I've stepped away from the voting booth. Who the hell am I supposed to vote for? Mm -hmm. And they told me, like, I'm talking about, these were even informed people, would say, listen, I'm gonna do one of two things. I'm gonna try to see whose names sound black and vote for the black sounding names, <laughs> or, I'm gonna, like, li like literally, or I have people say, listen, I'm just gonna vote for as many women as possible. Mm -hmm. Now that's at least, that's slightly better than nothing, but only slightly. It does matter what they stand for. Right, but, yes. but yes. people, here we are, yeah, yeah, yeah. here we are in this moment where we're all ready to use our vote to make a difference, and nobody even knows who the hell to vote for. Mm -hmm. Anywhere, and, I, and I'm getting it and hearing it every single day. And that has played itself out in the worst possible way with our justice system. Mm -hmm. Our nation has 2,400 people who are elected to run this thing. They are called district attorneys. But they are the gatekeepers of the justice system. They are the people who charge and convict over 90% of the people who are in prison. They're also the people who can choose not to charge and convict, mm -hmm. be it an officer or just an everyday person. Well, right now in America, in the past six years, the past six year election cycle, 89% of district attorneys ran unopposed. Mm. No one even challenged them. And, and, and including huge swaths of ultra conservative people, some in the Democratic Party and some out. Mm -hmm. They're 95% male, which is wild. 89% white. Mm -hmm. And less than 1% of America's DAs are women of color. Less than 1%. And, and I, don't mean, I don't just mean black women, but all women of color. Mm -hmm. And what we have found is that there is an opportunity for us to change the justice system from the inside out by not just putting people into that position who say, hey, I kind of like change a little bit, I'll do it incrementally. But in Philadelphia, your, your hometown, we helped, the Real Justice Pact helped elect a man, Larry Krasner, mm -hmm. who is crazy. <laughs> he is a, he is in a, all the best ways. yeah, in all the best ways. He is a civil rights attorney and activist. He sued the police department over 85 times mm -hmm. and now he oversees them. Mm -hmm. And they don't like and it. And they hate it. They hate it. And, and let me tell you, let me tell you, let me tell you what city has dropped the ball in the worst way when it comes to district attorneys, the five boroughs of New York. Mm. They, mm -hmm. here's what happened. So we found out that the DA of Manhattan was getting huge donations from Harvey Weinstein. Mm. Mm. At the same time, you, you won't hear this often, the NYPD was doing something great. Mm. You won't hear this from me often. Mm -hmm. They were doing something great and they built a case against Harvey Weinstein. Mm. Mm -hmm. presented it to him, mm -hmm. and he dropped it. Mm -hmm. Cy Vance, Manhattan's DA. So there was this huge movement of saying, let's vote somebody else in. This was just six months ago. The deadline to run a new candidate had already passed. Mm -hmm. We were completely asleep at the wheel. And it's not just those cases. There, there was a case that was built against the Trump family for mm -hmm. a real estate project not too far from here. Mm -hmm. And that case was presented to him, and they gave him significant donations. So like in, I live in Brooklyn and in Brooklyn, less than 3% of our residents voted for our DA in the last race. And our DA is just, he's really just decent. And 
there's no reason why in Brooklyn, in Manhattan, in Queens, in the Bronx, I don't know about Staten Island, but in those other four places, <laughs> in those other four places, there's no reason why we don't have amazing DAs. And in most, like... Okay, but c come on. I, 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 I think Krasner is, um, is doing some wild things in Philadelphia. And, you know, we'll see how long they let him continue well, to, to say, do that. He immediately said, I will not, we will no longer prosecute sex workers in this right. state. He immediately said, we will no longer prosecute He's going to free Meek Mill. Yeah, absolutely. He, he immediately said, I am here to free Meek Mill. But not only free Meek Mill, but I am, I am actually going to put in, places, put in place policies that will never create more Meek Mill. Right. And he described the policy. He said, we will no longer prosecute marijuana possession. And he said, what shocked everybody, he said, of any weight. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You can be walking down the street with a right. brick of it, and <laughs> you're okay. That's what he said. He said, any weight. Last uh -huh. year in this city, last year in New York City, 18,000 18, yeah. people were arrested and prosecuted in this city for low-level marijuana possession, right. even though the city said they were done with it. Right. That's 55 people a day. I, I agree in terms of, of what you're talking about with impact with the DA's office. I do think that, you know, I think that we also have to include in some aspect of this discussion, we have to, we have to be critical of this, this criminal justice system and that it's not enough to talk about, and I know that you, this is not the end of the story with you, but it's not enough to talk about good prosecutors and often police reform and criminal justice reform becomes the pretext for how do we make the, the, the system more effective? And what does a, a more effective criminal justice system mean for black and brown people? Well, let me, let more me. efficient ways to, to get people to prison. And so it's not to say that it's immaterial, but I, I do worry about a focus on getting good prosecutors, because one of the things with Krasner that I think is different is that he's, he, he's not a lifelong prosecutor. He's coming from the defense side, whereas you have someone like Kim Fox, who was a focal point of the movement um, in Chicago oh, to get rid of an admittedly horrible person, Anita Alvarez, who was sending people to prison for sport. But the alternative is, okay, Kim Fox, who plays footsie with the, with the movement, and she's going to yeah. do this and that. And, but her background is, she's a prosecutor of, of juveniles, right? I mean, and so many of these people come from a prosecutorial background where they're kind of invested in aspects of well, the system. So, I can't say it yet, but wait till you see on Wednesday who we endorse in Oakland. Mm. who we endorse in San Diego, mm -hmm. and they're not lifelong prosecutors. They are also, I, they, I'll just I'll okay. stop there. But okay. I will, here's what I say. I, I, I had a debate with, with a, a guy who said, listen, my goal is to dismantle the justice right. system. And I said, well, tell me how. Mm -hmm. Just tell me how, and, let's, and let, me follow, let me listen to you. And what I realized right away was almost humiliating. He had no idea how. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is one way of the 25 ways that we need to dismantle that system is to put someone who is the primary gatekeeper of the local system in place who says, listen, I'm going to stop prosecuting all of these things. I'm going to cut probation terms all the way down. We're going to, like Larry Krasner has said, listen, from now on, every single person you prosecute, I need you to right. tell me how long, or how expensive, rather, a and prison sentence would be. And you have to justify the be, expense. And you have to tell me why every dollar of that matters and why right. it's worth it. And so he has said, listen, I don't even see this office as an office of arrest and prosecution. Mm -hmm. We see this as a place of justice. Mm -hmm. And he said, ultimately, my goal is for us to have so few cases that we are primarily just investigating uh, the few violent crimes. And then our, 
office will spend the resources that we have of even figuring out how do we reduce those. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people who say, hey, I want to dismantle the system, when I throw back to them, map out for me what that looks like, people struggle. Well, I, I mean, I want to dismantle the system. And I think that there are, are two things. And that, that isn't to say, therefore, sure. we should you know, just hang out until the system somehow... Oh, I want to is dismantle dis the system. No, no, right. I know. But <laughs> there's a relationship between, like, we should be absolutely fighting for every single reform of the criminal justice system in the death penalty, in cash bail, like all of those things that you can actually map out right. how, how, how to do that. And then I think that those things have to be connected to a larger critique of the system itself. Sure. And which is not to say that it's easy because you can't dismantle, dismantle the police, the criminal justice system, without dealing with the fundamental, as King said, radical reconstruction of American society because those institutions exist to keep the status quo intact. So when you have activists who say, okay, well, what, we want control of the police in our community. It's like, well, good luck. Because <laughs> the police are the armed wing of the state that exists to preserve the order. So they're not actually going to give you control of the police. Yeah, but see, what I'm saying is, I actually, no, I actually agree, with, like, I also want that. Right. And I'm saying, I think there are some ways to actually have that control. It's not, it's not going to be through an armed revolution. There, there are multiple ways to do that. In many cities, the mayor appoints the police chief. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it is putting in place a, a person who values a certain level of integrity, a certain philosophy of policing, putting in place a mayor who is going to then appoint or running for mayor yourself, whatever that may be. But it's also figuring out uh, even how, if, if in some places a DA has the power to create uh, community boards that have binding mm -hmm. resolutions. So some of it is just saying, I think there are ways to do these, these like grandiose things that sound very unrealistic. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying there are very political ways to get them done, but part of the struggle is so many of us have been fighting from outside the system mm -hmm. for so long that our, our operating philosophy is, hey, you, do better. And, I, and what I'm finding is that hardly works. The, to me, the better operating system is going to be, you know, let's get in and do better. Now, the, the problem is people regularly <laughs> overpromise and underdeliver, and I know that. But there are good people. Like, um, there's a, a wonderful woman in uh, Minneapolis, and I saw people asking her, like, hey, why don't you run for DA? And she's like, why the hell would I ever do that? Because mm -hmm. she's been a lifelong civil rights attorney. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to help her understand is, like, listen, reorient your mind to understand that the system you've seen yourself and an enemy of for so long, that there is a way for us to change it from the inside out. Now, we will always need people on the outside critiquing and demanding, but if we completely abandon, like, part of our challenge is, I speak at, I speak at law schools all over the country, and even law students, I'll ask them, how many of you want to be prosecutors? It's none of them. Mm -hmm. They want to be civil rights attorneys. They want to be well, entertainment Because they don't want lawyers. to send people to jail. Yeah. yeah. And, or, or, no, absolutely. Or if I speak at a high school and I say, how many of you want to be police officers? Nobody wants to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, what's happened, though, and that's been in place. That's not a new feeling. After 20 years of that, we've completely, we've given over the system. Except the, the, the thing that I would say is that a chief strategy coming out of the 1960s was to blacken the police department, right. was to blacken City Hall, uh, was to stop keeping black and brown people out and to actually integrate black and brown people into the system. And so you have some of the, the blackest, most female 
LGBT police forces in American history, and by your own tally, they're killing people like they have never killed people before. And so, which is to say that it's not just about representation within right. these institutions, that without a social movement that is really ultimately what forces these, these organizations <clears throat> and institutions to at least adhere somewhat to, to what we're saying, that I think the, the dominant example, at least if looking at a previous period where this was a strategy, has been that the individuals adapt to the circumstances that they're in. Right. They don't actually transform the system from the inside uh, out, which is not to say that these things are immaterial. I think for me at least, it's about understanding where we have the most power and control and, and, and the ways that, you know, I think, because I think many of these people do get into politics because they want to make a difference. The Congressional Black Caucus in 1971 began, their slogan was, we're the conscience of the Congress. I mean, they are not the conscience of the Congress now. Right, right. You know, and so, and that's not, they're bad people. Sure. They, you know, that's, that's what happens when you're in that and there's the no- is strong. Yeah, and, and there's no right. motor that is forcing you to do something different. And so that, that's part of the, sure. the dynamic. Sure. I think, I think we, we got to take a question or yes, yes. We, we might end up here all night. <laughs> Why not, let's take, let's take a couple. But we'd love you to take a okay. question. Actually, we're a handful of questions. Okay. Actually, four questions. <laughs> <laughs> And I think they're, they're four good questions. So thank you, yes, very much. I, I just want to make it clear this is the first time you applaud. There'll be a few more times when you can. Okay. First question. Climate change does not discriminate. Everyone will be affected but communities of color will be disproportionately affected mm -hmm. around the world in a time of climate denialism in the US. How do we raise awareness of the intersection between climate and racial justice? That's a great question. I, I mean, I think it's, you know, along the lines of many of the things that um, we're talking about. I thought the, the point that you made about um, bringing attention to some of these issues should not be discounted. And, and it can feel like, well, attention is not enough. But I think when, when there is this still, I mean, part of the effect of, of Black Lives Matter, I think, as a movement, has been to show that, you know, the issues with policing is not just about a bad apple here or there. Right. And part of doing that means bringing attention to the particular cases. And the, the issues of environmental racism, people don't know, right? People don't know that 50% of uh, Latino communities um, exist with air quality uh, that by EPA standards, while they still have standards, um, is unhealthy, right? Um, people don't, people think of environmentalism as this thing that white college students deal with. They don't understand the ways that black communities have been dumping grounds uh, for uh, uh, hazardous uh, uh, chemicals, um, uh, corporate waste. They don't understand uh, the issues with uh, poor working class black and brown uh, communities that do suffer disproportionately from this. This is part of the power of the story of Flint, um, Michigan. It's like elevating um, that story. So part of, I think, making the, the connection between um, the, the climate issues and the way that they impact poor and working class communities 
really does mean talking about it. It means writing about it. Naomi Klein wrote this incredible piece for The Intercept about uh, the, the, the struggle for Puerto Rico and the attacks, um, uh, the, the using the hur hurricane to, uh, to really push through a privatized corporate agenda in Puerto Rico. And so part of this is, you know, those, those of us who are in a position to do so, to actually bring attention to some of these issues. Yeah, and I think, just to, I'll, to close the loop on that, um, some of it is we often move so much from crisis to crisis and from, be it if it's, if it's an issue of injustice, we're moving from murder to murder, emergency to emergency, or hashtag to hashtag, and issues of, of the environment don't fit into that narrative so easily. Mm -hmm. But it, it mm. is, as you said, it's deeply woven, like um, Freddie Gray, who was killed mm. in Baltimore, Freddie and his family were horrible victims of environmental discrimination and had suffered through lead poisoning for years and mm -hmm. years and years. And, and so it matters. They had actually successfully sued the city. Right. And because of uh, lead levels. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and it, it affected their whole family right. in, in amazing way, in horrible ways. But it doesn't, like these issues, even my friends who are environmentalists, it is difficult to tell that story in a tweet, mm -hmm. in a Facebook post, mm -hmm. in a in a quick video of a 30 second clip. And so some of it is right, right, right. figuring out how to tell the narrative of global warming and environmental issues in this social media environment that is so headline driven, emergency driven. My, my expression of that is like, so at the beginning of this Black Lives Matter movement, I was actually working at an environmental charity called Global Green. And um, I left that charity to do the work that I'm doing now but my expression of how to do this is, is basically to find other people who specialize in the environment and to amplify their work the best that I can, mm -hmm. knowing that I have almost mm -hmm. no time mm -hmm. to do it myself. So some of, it, some of the answer to that is those of you who feel burdened to fight for the environment, uh, you, you sometimes may need to help connect and instruct someone like me how I can better amplify and connect your work. But it's, it's tricky because we all, all of us feel so overwhelmed mm -hmm. by so many different issues that often in, in that feeling of being overwhelmed, certain things fall to the wayside mm -hmm. for us. Now, I, I've seen a couple of people leave. I want nobody else to leave, <laughs> okay? Not allowed. You have to stay until you hear Martin Luther King at the end, okay? How do ma mass incarceration and the prison industrial complex fit into the discussion tonight? Well, they fit in, in so many different ways. Um, a part of what I hoped we could echo tonight and, and um, what our work even as, as people who still have hope in this country being better, part of what, and one of the reasons I love being on this panel with you, part of which, what the two of us try to do is to try to expose the complicated systems that make this country work. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then and to lift up the leaders who are doing something about it. But, um, you know, mass incarceration as I see it, and there's so many books that I would recommend, but part of why I love the new Jim Crow or Ava DuVernay's documentary 13th, mass incarceration was created in, in a lot of ways was created as a response to the gains of the civil rights movement. And some of what we have to understand is, like when you're right in the middle of a crisis, it can be hard to unpack, well, why does this exist? And that's what you said, it's like, as, as even the young kids of Parkland begin to unpack the why, mm -hmm. they'll get more and more enemies mm 
Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the why of why mass incarceration existed, why it exploded in the 70s and 80s, really gets to, you know, what America stands for and, and issues of power. Uh, I'll pass it on to you, but, you know, it's, it's, it is an expression of power. And it's about not just, it's about votes. It's about, there, were, there was great fear after the civil rights movement and the black power movement mm -hmm. as the, the, the cultural makeup and the ethnic makeup of this country changed, there was great fear that people would vote in such large numbers that certain people would never get office, in office again. And, um, and all of a sudden we start seeing not tens of thousands, but hundreds of thousands and then millions of people incarcerated, losing their voting rights, losing their, their franchise in that sense. And so it's, it's, it's always about power. And, um, and part of what we try to do is unpack who, who's pulling those levers. I would just say it remains a form, the threat of imprisonment remains a form, a very potent form of social control yes. um, in this country yeah. and has to be understood uh, as such. And, you know, there, there's a relationship between the United States being one of the most unequal uh, societies in the world and having one of the highest uh, prison populations. Absolutely. And we have to make those uh, those connections and always, for me at least, it is critical to then get back to the systemic uh, root of that and understand that part of dismantling all of this means understanding, um, as Sean says, why it exists in the first place. And so that is very much connected to uh, the issues of social control in a society that fundamentally has no answers to poverty, inequality, that pervades uh, the society. Two more questions. You commented on the NRA. <laughs> what do you think about Alec? <laughs> yeah, that's, no, that's a great, that's a great question. Uh, uh, the question, I mentioned the NRA, and part of why I mentioned them is, like, as they are as they are demonized and criticized, I don't want you to miss how good they are at what they do, and how sophisticated of an operation it is, how well funded, well organized it is, and and that we are living in the consequences of the quality of their work. We are experiencing that. And this question about Alec which, and, and other corporations and organizations that operate behind the scenes, it's, it's an important one. I, I think some of, like, some of what many of us have tried to do over the past few years is even get to who, who is writing the checks? Who is funding the things that bother us the most? Who are the who are the, the financiers of our own oppression? And uh, one of the things that we did um, in Seattle, a group of activists, and they were the first, city, the first large city in America to do this, demanded that their first their city council, then their mayor, divest all city mm -hmm. funds from any bank or corporation that was funding the Dakota Access Pipeline or funding private prisons. Mm -hmm. and, and they had been fighting for that for years and just last year, Seattle became the first major city in America to remove a multi-billion dollar contract from Wells Fargo, their bank. And then, and then a dozen other cities followed. Some of that, it just, what we're talking about when we do that is to say, Again, let's be more sophisticated about how we do dismantle the system. Let's figure out who, who are the financiers, who are the power players, and figure out do we have any leverage or influence there. And um, I, I think part of what I like about where our, our country is going is I see people caring more about the details yeah. of democracy than I, than I think I ever have. 
I'll say two things. One is that everyone should read Nancy McLean's book, Democracy in Chains, uh, which goes through uh, the, the politics and the history of uh, the Koch brothers network, uh, which is, is, is really at the foundation um, of ALEC. I think with the NRA, um, you know, I, I, I think the, the NRA is a little bit in a uh, emperor with no clothes and being exposed yeah. uh, moment that, you know, they've taken on the teenagers and the teenagers are really kicking their ass right. um, in, the, right. in the, right. the, the propaganda <laughs> realm. And I, I think that, you know, it's easy uh, for groups like that when they're reflected uh, uh, in power and there's a consistency uh, between them and the Republican Party that is sometimes difficult uh, for our side to necessarily uh, reflect in political leaders because the, the political leaders that are supposed to be representing us are so duplicitous uh, in terms of trying to curry favor uh, with what they define as, as, as progressives where there's much more symmetry uh, between groups like the NRA and the right wing. There's less chance for you know, uh, a, a disruption of that. But I do think that the, the confrontation of um, these young people has really exposed, you know, the, the, the NRA is a little bit like, um, you know, Oz. You know, they've pulled back the curtain and there's, you know, some like little wimp, you know, yeah. standing yeah. back yeah. there. I mean, Dana Loesch looks like a fool now. Uh, and they're the, the kind of derision and open mocking. Um, I think has been uh, uh, has been really effective, which you know is again about being on the offensive um, with these people, which I think a lot of times our side is used to being completely defensive about these things um, that the, the the kids are showing um, that you know if you you stand up to these people that um, they get somewhat exposed. Do you want to take one more? Yes. Okay. Indeed. So one more question, and then we will hear uh, Martin Luther King. Um, his speech is called Remaining Awake Through a Great Revolution. And again, just to remind you, it's a speech he gave at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. on March 31st, 1968, four days before his assassination. The final question is as follows. What is the next step after awareness in order for us to get justice? <laughs> you, you can take your time. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll even uh, make it a little bigger than, than just justice. I think one of the things that I try, I even teach my, I have, I have five kids and two, two teenage daughters who are the age of the Parkland students, part of what I try to teach my children and even teach across the country is whatever it is that you decide to do to make a difference in the world, it really does start with a really firm decision. Like it starts with you saying, this is the thing that I am going to attack, address, and here's where, where, I, where it almost always goes wrong for people. Like you can't, don't look at me and see what I'm frustrated about and then just purely adopt my frustration as yours. Like what, you, what you're frustrated about says so much about you. And part of what I would like for you to do is to be able to ask yourself, like what is the thing in the world that breaks my heart, that, that crushes my spirit, crushes my soul. And for you, that answer may be wildly different than it is for me. Like that answer for me is rooted deeply in my own experience and in my own life. And so because it's so personal, I, I'm, I'm able to weather storms, weather criticism, because it's, it's rooted in who I am. And part of what I want for each of you is to be able to have a struggle, a fight that's deeply rooted in who you are. And you have to be able to, and so for you, that may be the environment. For you, like I, I meet people who, who for them, it may literally be 
animal rights. It may be something wildly different than what it is for me, but once you answer that question of what is it that breaks my heart, you have to make a decision that you are going to dedicate time, energy, resources, your life to actually trying to make a difference with it. And you will stop seeing that struggle as a struggle that's dominant, that is so influenced by headlines or hashtags. Like, you'll, you will weather out many different phases of that struggle. You'll grow with it. You'll make mistakes. But if it's not rooted in, in who you are, when, when things get hard, like when, when shit hits the fan, you'll bail out. And it's, I've, many of us have been hurt by people who were just temporarily committed to this. They weren't, they weren't really serious, and when it got complicated or difficult or controversial, they bailed. And that's why I really would like for you to interrogate yourself and, and determine what is my what is my struggle and and hopefully we will each get to the point where we respect each other's answer so i have four things um the <coughs> the first thing is to get organized um that there's next to nothing that you can do on your own um aside from moral witness you know which actually which has an important role sure. in struggle, but is not enough. And there are enough people uh, who think like you, who are frustrated uh, about the same things and want to do something. Um, and so you have to be organized and connect with those people uh, because that is the most effective way um, to collectively influence what happens in the world around you. The second thing is to think. Um, and thinking, means not just accepting what we're told is the answer. And so Ella Baker, uh, who is a leader in the civil rights movement, used to say as part of her uh, talks to uh, civil rights groups in the, you know, in the, the early 1960s, um, that what does it mean to be radical? That the Latin meaning of radical is root, it means to look beneath the surface, what is underneath. And in order to even know that that is where you should look, you have to think and think about what it is that you're being told, think about what is wrong, and, and really it's about being engaged in the world around you. The third thing is you have to read. And reading is about connecting with a history that is larger than the world that we live in today. That really, the idea for me, the, the, the reason why I feel disgusted by Trump and everything going on in our world, but not pessimistic about it, is because I know that there are periods in time in this country where people have organized and struggled and actually changed what happens in this country. Um, and that that comes from history, that comes from understanding, especially in this country where we are so disconnected from our past, uh, that we are so disconnected from the idea that there is uh, a radical tradition in the United States. And the only way to get reacquainted or reconnected with that is to actually read and to, to look at history and to understand something uh, about what has come before you. And then the last thing is hope. Mm -hmm. And hope is not blind faith. It's not this idea uh, of, of just wishing for things to be different. It, at its core, is the desire for things to be different, is the desire for uh, 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 is a desire for the world to be better than it is now. And I think for me, hope comes from those previous three things, right? It comes from being connected to other people uh, through organizing. It comes from, from thinking and feeling like I don't have to just accept 
the nonsense and garbage that those people tell me. And it comes from having an engagement with history and a knowledge that things have been different before and that ordinary people have the capacity and the ability to change the world. And so that is what comes after you recognize that there's a problem. It's not to be passive, it's not to be overwhelmed by it, it's to use that information to activate yourself and then do something because no one is coming to save us from these people. We are all that we have and we're enough. Now, now, thank you. Thank you and for that, that comment about being decisive. I found that really important and illuminating and it reminded me of what a famous English psychoanalyst, Winnicott, once said. He said, tell me what you fear, and I will tell you what happened to you. Let's listen to Martin Luther King. One day, we will have to stand before the God of history, and we will talk in terms of things we've done. Yes, we will be able to say, we build gargantuan bridges to span the seas. We build gigantic buildings to kiss the skies. Yes, we made our submarines to penetrate oceanic depths. We brought, brought into being many other things with our scientific and technological power. And it seems that I can hear the God of history saying, that was not enough, but I was hungry. And ye fed me not. I was naked and ye clothed me not. I was devoid of a decent sanitary house to live in. And ye provided no shelter for me. And consequently you cannot enter the kingdom of greatness. If ye do it unto the least of these, my brethren, ye do it unto me. That's the question facing America today. And I want to say one other challenge that we face is simply that we must find an alternative to war and bloodshed. Anyone who feels, and there are still a lot of people who feel that way, that war can solve the social problems facing mankind is sleeping through a revolution. President Kennedy said on one occasion, mankind must put an end to war. A war will put an end to mankind. The world must hear this. I pray God that America will hear this before it is too late, because today we are fighting a war. I'm convinced that it is one of the most unjust wars that has ever been fought in the history of the world. Our involvement in the war in Vietnam has torn up the Geneva Accord. It has strengthened the military-industrial complex. It has strengthened the forces of reaction in our nation. It has put us against the self-determination of the vast majority of Vietnamese people and put us in a position of protecting a corrupt regime that is stacked against the poor. It has played havoc with our domestic destinies. And this day we are spending $500,000 to kill every Viet Cong soldier. Every time we kill one, we spend about $500,000, while we spend only $53 a year for every person characterized as 
poverty-stricken in the so-called poverty program, which is not even a good skirmish against poverty. But not only that, it has put us in a position of appearing to the world as an arrogant nation. And here we are 10,000 miles away from home, fighting for the so-called freedom of the Vietnamese people when we've not even put our own house in order. And we force young black men and young white men to fight and kill in brutal solidarity. And yet when they come back home, they can't hardly live on the same block together. The judgment of God is upon us today. And we could go right down the line and see that something must be done, and something must be done quickly.